coming to you now is Bread of His Presence with your host, Pastor Cameron Urie, Senior Pastor and Bible Teacher at Renton Park Chapel in Renton, Washington. Well, greetings and welcome again to Bread of His Presence. You know, last week we began taking a look at two of the most powerful and touching miracles of Jesus given to us anywhere in Scripture. And unlike most other miracles, which seem kind of isolated from one another, these are seen to collide with one another. I would even say they're intertwined with one another. And that is the healing of the woman with the issue of blood and the raising of a young girl who has died back to life. And the raising of the young girl is the planned miracle, but the healing of the woman with the issue of blood is the, I should say, seemingly unplanned miracle. Go ahead and look with me, starting at verse 22 of Mark chapter 5. It reads, Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And seeing him, Jesus, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come, lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. And so we see that Jesus, he's approached by this man by the name of Jairus, who is identified as being one of the rulers of the synagogue. And really what that means is that he is a synagogue official. He's not a scribe, he's not a rabbi, no, he's part of a group of men, which usually numbered between three and seven in each local synagogue, who acted as the caretakers and the administrators of synagogue life. They would safeguard the scrolls, they would care for the facility, organize the synagogue school, and supervise the various readers, teachers, and those who prayed. And as such, Jairus would have been very, very religious, very devout, and very highly respected in his community. Now, none of the gospel writers identify Jairus as a member of the Pharisees. And yet, even so, his position in the synagogue meant that he was very intimately connected with the Pharisaic establishment there in Capernaum. He was undoubtedly aware of the hatred that the religious leaders had toward Jesus. And yet, he's willing to very publicly seek Jesus out because he needs Jesus' help. And this is because he is desperate. He knows that his daughter has no hope unless Jesus comes to heal her. And he knows that Jesus could heal her, not just because of what he had heard, and he had heard a lot about the many healings of Jesus in that region, but also because of what he himself may have seen. This was likely not the first time that he had seen a miracle of Jesus. In fact, we see that in Luke 4, verses 33 to 37, that Jesus had already cast a demon out of a man in Jairus' synagogue. Jairus very well could have been there that day and witnessed that miracle firsthand. And it's not every day that you see a preacher have to stop his sermon to suddenly cast a demon out of one of the attendees. And if Jairus was there that day, that would have left an indelible impression on his psyche. And so Jairus knows what Jesus can do for his daughter. And so here, through the crowd, comes this very respected synagogue official. He comes to Jesus, he throws himself at his feet, and in Mark's gospel it says, fell at his feet, but in Matthew's account it says, he bowed down. And significantly, Matthew used the Greek word proskeneo, which is often translated worshipped. Very unusual for any Jew, especially a Jewish leader, but that is what he does. And it says, he implored him, Jesus, earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come, lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And here, he is demonstrating absolute faith, 
absolute trust in Jesus. In fact, according to Matthew 9.18, he believed Jesus could not only heal his daughter, but if necessary, he could even raise her from the dead. And so Jesus, seeing his faith, goes with him. And of course, so does the crowd. It says in verse 24 and following, And he went with him, and a great crowd followed him, and thronged about him. And you can picture Jairus doing his best just to try to clear the way for Jesus, but to little avail. Everyone is just pressing in all around them. And as they're going along, an unexpected miracle takes place. It says, And there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for twelve years. Now, what the cause of this woman's issue of blood was, we're not told. It could have been caused by any number of things. But what we do know is how this affected her. Having a constant hemorrhage of blood would mean a loss of strength, and if left untreated, could leave her in danger of very severe physical defects, and even death. Plus, it being a female problem, it would have caused her a great deal of embarrassment. But more than that, because of Leviticus chapter 12 and 15, a woman in such a state would be considered unclean for seven days after her discharge. And so what that meant was that this poor woman was in a permanent state of uncleanness, and therefore she could not touch or be touched. She was probably now divorced or had never married. And she was very marginal to Jewish society. She was an outcast, both from society, but also from the synagogue and the temple, and had been, apparently, for 12 years. Now, this whole seven days of purification, after you had a normal discharge of blood, God had designed that to be a picture of what sin does to us. It soils us, it defiles us, it corrupts us. But we see here that this woman was living continually in that state, unable to escape that reminder. Now, she had tried by every means she could to be cured. It says in verse 26, And who had suffered much under many physicians, and had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. And some of you can probably relate to that. And this passage is not really a good advertisement for the local Capernaum Medical Center, is it? But keep in mind that it wasn't until the 19th century that anyone ever really cured somebody else of disease, medicinally. And that was because nobody understood the pathology of disease. And this woman's situation is a very good illustration of this, as we actually know some of the treatments for her condition that were being prescribed at that time. In fact, the Jewish Talmud listed 11 possible remedies for such an infirmity. And these included superstitious prescriptions, like placing the ashes of an ostrich egg in a cloth sack or carrying around a barley corn kernel procured from female donkey dung, or drinking wine with alum and crocuses, or wine with onions. None of these things obviously worked. In fact, the text says she rather grew worse. (laughs) No surprise. By the way, it's so funny to me to note that Mark is the one who tells us this. Luke, who actually was one of the physicians during that time, he leaves that part out. (laughs) I don't know, maybe he's exercising a little bit of discretion. Um, By the way, do you know what he says in his account? She was incurable. (laughs) And at least with Luke's and every other physician's skill set during that time, that was no doubt true. And yet this woman had spent all that she had on these doctors and their crazy medical treatments. And now she is penniless and broke and yet still uncured. Now, as I already said, in many ways, this woman is the opposite of Jairus. 
One commentator rightly points out that he was a very highly respected leader of the synagogue. She was a social outcast who, due to her condition, had been ostracized from Jewish religious life. She couldn't even go into the synagogue. While Jairus had known 12 years of joy and happiness with his daughter, this woman had experienced 12 years of heartache and rejection because of her ailment. Yet, she and Jairus shared this in common. They both knew that Jesus was their only hope. And in that hope, she comes to Jesus. And she's taking a huge risk because in doing that, she's bumping up against and therefore making unclean many of the other people in that crowd. And she could get into a whole heap of trouble if she is discovered. And yet, that is the risk that she is willing to take. It says in verse 27, she had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. Now, because there was always a possibility of accidentally coming into contact with a woman who was having her monthly period, many teachers avoided touching women altogether, lest they become accidentally contaminated. Yet Jesus didn't have an ounce of that mentality. He was always approachable, always available, always touchable to anyone who needed him. Now, she doesn't know that, and so she, maybe almost crawling through the crowds, hunched over with her head down, she makes her way to Jesus and secretly touches his garment. Verse 28, For she said, If I touch even his garments, I will be made well. Now, the part of Jesus' garment that she lays hold of was called the tzitzit. The plural is tzitziot. Because observant Jewish men in Yeshua's time and today have worn fringes on the corners of their garments. And that's in keeping with Numbers chapter 15, verses 37 to 41. The third of the three Torah passages recited in the Shema portion of the synagogue service. And these fringes are made in a special way and have this very unique appearance. They're made of blue and white cords woven together, and their purpose is to remind God's people to obey his commandments. It might be compared to tying a string around your finger. But since they're not merely decorations, the usual renderings of Greek kraspidon meaning hem or fringe or border or tassel, ought actually to be rendered tzitzit. Kraspidon is the same word that is used in the Septuagint, the ancient Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures, to translate tzitzit. Now, today Jewish men wear tzitziot on a talit gadal, a large talit, which is not an article of clothing, but a ritual cloth that was donned primarily for synagogue worship. Or, oftentimes, they would be adorned on a talit katan, a little talit, which is kind of this undergarment, especially designed with corners for the tzitziot. But Yeshua, he wore his on his robe, which was this heavy, wool, blanket-like overgarment, similar to that worn by Bedouins today. Now, one commentator points out there's no fixed maximum length for the tzitziot. But it seems that there were some who, in an attempt to observe this commandment more fully, wore very long tzitziot. In fact, a wealthy Jerusalem resident is mentioned in the Talmud who received his nickname Ben Tzitzit Hakaset because of his long tassels. He was remembered as being so devout that his tzitziot literally trailed behind him on the ground. Naturally, there were also imitators who wished to appear more pious than they were by wearing longer than normal tzitziot. And that's why Jesus condemned those who pretended to be pious by wearing these long tzitziot. Now, Jesus' tzitziot would have been standard length. But nevertheless, 
they would likely have been considered the holiest parts of his garments. And it's this that she lays hold of, the tzitzit talita, that is, the tzitzit, the tassel of his talit, his mantle. Now, a fascinating tradition developed about the mantle. Because of how it looked when you spread your arms, it also became known as wings. And we saw this back, (laughs) way back, in our study of the book of Ruth, when Ruth comes to propose to Boaz at the threshing floor. It says, So she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had commanded her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Then she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. At midnight, the man was startled and turned over, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. He said, Who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. Now, in the book of Malachi, we are given an amazing prophecy about the coming Messiah, whom I believe Boaz, though just a man, symbolized. It says of the Messiah in Malachi 4.2, But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. In other words, in his talit. And you will go free, leaping with joy like calves led out to pasture. Maybe this woman had this prophecy in mind when she laid hold of Jesus' talit, his tzitzit. We don't know. But regardless, it says that after she did this, and immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Now, we're out of time today, and unfortunately, we're going to have to pick up where we left off next week. But I don't want to rush through this material because there is so much going on behind the scenes, so to speak. And yet, I want to close today with our imagining what both this man and this woman are feeling at this point. Both have hit absolute rock bottom and are desperate. And that is so often where God needs to bring us before we are willing to reach out and lay hold of him. And that's what they both do. But are you and I as desperate for Jesus? Are we yet willing to do anything to present ourselves before his feet? This week, in your quiet time with Jesus, ask him to make you more desperate for him. Pray that word over your life, over your family's life. Because when we are desperately thirsty, it is then that we will come to he who is the fountain of living water. Do so this week. Amen. Today's episode of Bread of His Presence is brought to you by Renton Park Chapel, a church that is committed to the ministry of sharing the joy of hearing and doing God's Word and to the mission of bringing people into the life-giving presence of Jesus Christ in and through vibrant preaching, teaching, Bible study, prayer, and ministry to a world that is in desperate need of the healing touch of Jesus Christ. If you'd like to learn more about our ministry here at Renton Park Chapel or would like to subscribe to the Bread of His Presence podcast, you can visit us online at rentonparkchapel.org or breadofhispresence.org. You can also find us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you for listening. And may you know all the fullness of having in your life the Bread of the Presence of God. 